the Triathlon Show, episode 200. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode I bring you another interview where I was a guest on a different podcast and replay it here on That Triathlon Show. And this interview is uh, from my appearance on the Strong Savvy Cyclist and Triathlete podcast with host Menachem Brody, who was a guest on this podcast in episodes 182 and 183. We discuss things like the importance of building a strong aerobic base, seeing the big picture and setting long-term goals, the correct execution of different types of workouts, an example training week for somebody training eight hours per week, and how to keep your training sustainable for the long term, which is so, so important when it comes to improvements. There's quite a bit more as well, but you'll find it out in the interview. I really hope that you enjoy this interview, and if you do, make sure to check out the Strong Savvy Cyclist and Triathlete podcast, as well as uh, Menachem's website, Human Vortex Training, and his social media to have a look at all of the content that he produces, which is really, really good. Before we get into the interview, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. And uh, one of their most interesting blog posts that I read recently is uh, one on whether you should combine your carbohydrate and electrolyte drinks. The advice given by Precision Hydration is to get most of your calories from more solid foods uh, because uh, this approach typically results in less overall GI distress for the majority of athletes, especially in the heat or during very long events. The reason for this is uh, probably that when you eat solid food like uh, bars or chews, etc., and you drink only water and electrolytes, then your stomach is better able to control the rate that calories move from there into your gut and small intestine, where they are ultimately absorbed into the bloodstream. And this is the case because the food comes together as a bolus in the stomach, which enables slower digest digestion and absorption in comparison to only taking on liquids. You can read much, much more. There's plenty of great content on the PH blog and their newsletter. Uh, so check it out. And also check out their free online sweat test to get uh, an estimate for how much you sweat and how much salt or sodium your sweat contains. You can then try your first box or tube of Precision Hydration Electrolytes for free with the promo code that Triathlon Show, all on word, all caps. And big thanks to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Roka has, has recently entered the swim run sport, and this is very exciting news. They have created a swim run edition of their Maverick wetsuit line. And uh, as you know, I really like swim run. I'm actually a past uh, Finnish swim run champion, even though the competition wasn't very deep in that particular race. But still, it's, uh, it's something. And uh, we have done several swim run episodes that you can find if you search through the archives of the podcast. So definitely check, check it out and try a swim run if you haven't done so before, because it's so much fun. It's such an adventure. And uh, for me, as somebody who has dabbled in swim run, to see that Aroka has entered the swim run market is uh, really, really great. It will definitely help swim runners keep pushing the limits of what can be done in uh, swim running across the globe and also it will help all swim run wetsuit manufacturers to up their game and keep producing greater and greater swim run wetsuits so a little bit of competition is uh, great news in that sense as well you can check out roca's uh, maverick wetsuit line as well as things like their tri suits swim skins eyewear etc on roca.com and you can get 20 percent off your entire order with the promo code tts all caps Without any further ado, let's hear this interview that uh, I did for the Strong Savvy Cyclist and Triathlete podcast with uh, Menachem Brody. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I feel like we're going to, we, we've already covered so much in the intro here beforehand. I feel like there's so much to talk about. Thank you, Menachem. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And yeah, uh, it's uh, exciting. I'm uh, ready to ready to roll, ready to get going. 
Well, there's been a lot uh, that we've talked about uh, before we jumped on and, and started recording. Uh, you've been doing that triathlete show, uh, triathlon show rather, for quite some time now, and you're just starting to make your own appearances as a guest on podcasts. Uh, can you Do you mind sharing with us a little bit more about uh, how you made that transition, or was it just something that naturally happened? Yeah, it, it was uh, both. I mean, uh, for one thing, for sure, like the, that triathlon show has become more and more popular and grown uh, slowly but steadily uh, since February or March 2017 when, when I launched it and uh, had uh, very few listeners. And, and now it's definitely becoming one of the more popular triathlon podcasts in the world, I, I think. And, uh, and uh, that's uh, something that's obviously been great to see but also it's so as an athlete and as a coach, I always want to improve as a podcaster. I also want to improve and improve the results I get with my podcast. So improving the, the reach that it has and getting on other podcasts has been one way of, of doing that. So in some cases I have reached out to, to other podcasts in the endurance space. And in, in some cases it's been more like a, a connection thing. Like I've had some people on my show and then I end up on their interviews, like, like we're doing now uh, sort of. So I've been on some of those podcasts as well. So, so it's, partially because of that networking effect i guess that it has it has happened so so it's been both but in some cases i've just reached out to a podcast that i think that i listen to and and like and uh, asked if i can come on and and then if they agree then i've been been on as a guest and it's been great and there's always so much to learn just just listening into that triathlon show i mean you clearly have built up from being a runner and having those overuse injuries and transitioning to a triathlete it's very clear that you've read a lot. Uh, you also are keeping up with the research. You know, how have you found that transition of going from someone who's new to the sport and, and trying to figure out, okay, uh, I believe uh, you kind of put it, can a complete nobody with no genetic gifts for endurance sports and lacking a long background of training one day become a professional triathlete? How did that transition happen? And, and how, have you, how have you progressed the last uh, year and a half since you started that podcast? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I started triathlon way way before the podcast, but but I'm still fairly new to the sport. I'm I'm four years into the sport, and before that, I was doing running, but still recreationally. Uh, so, so my first marathon, for example, was uh, just below four hours. I just broke the four hour mark, I think, and and then I got down to a two fifty marathon with uh, many years of of training, but for a long time it was just recreational, forty five times per week and I wasn't consistent throughout the year I would have a month when I didn't run etc so uh, but but I got more and more into endurance sports through that running career but then unfortunately as I was improving and getting better results I I also got injuries and and that's how I transitioned in 2015 to triathlon and uh, and started to just uh, ride my bike and or get a bike and ride a bike and then learn to swim to I mean, I could swim a little bit, but learn to swim better and use that as cross training to just keep fit while I was hoping to get back to running after getting rid of that injury, which then ended up not happening. I did get rid of the injury, but, uh, but I was stuck with, with multi-sport from, from that moment on. So, I mean, it's been, I started reading things like Jack Daniels and Pete Fitzinger and the uh, Lydiards and the classic, uh, classic running literature fairly early on in my in my career, I was an engineer, studying engineering at that time, and very fascinated in in science and and how to train properly. So, so I just consumed that sort of content as much as I could, and and I took that into triathlon as well, that same attitude. And then I just trained and raced for a couple of years while I was learning the sport myself, how to how to do it. And then I had been coaching a bit in running. So once I felt that I had actually learned triathlon to a good enough level that I could coach. I started to unofficially coach some people, and and also at the sort of the same time I started the the podcast in two, early 2017, and uh, and yeah, from from there on I become more and more serious about triathlon, and and then in 2018, no, seven, 17 actually, October 2017, I quit my engineering job and and moved to Portugal and became a coach full time rather than part time as I was before and have been able to also focus a lot more on my training. But you mentioned professional. I'm not professional, though. I'm, I'm a fast age grouper, uh, but, uh, but not, not professional. And 
I have been thinking about whether I should take a pro card or not, but right now I'm leaning towards that's not really what motivates me. And if I had to choose between coaching and my own athletic career, I would choose coaching. And I don't want to, I guess, compromise my coaching development and coaching career for my athletic career. So I'm just going to try to maximize my my coaching career and become as good a coach as I can possibly be. And that allows me the flexibility to train as sort of like a, a sub elite triathlete, which is great, which I enjoy and being one of the best age groupers in the races that I enter. But but I'm probably not going to want to take the, the professional route at, at any point right now. And that's something that, that I think is really interesting because uh, you've kept that in, in the bio. And it seems to me, just listening to your show for the last five or six months, that this is pretty much it's still driving you, but as a coach, okay, how do we build someone? Uh, let's say, and, and we'll make this the first question. How do we build someone from no genetic gifts, so to speak, and no background of endurance sports into essentially getting them as high as they can? So the question would be then, you know, you took this as your own question uh, when you were coming in as an athlete, and now you've recognized that that coaching is the passion and you're, you're still competing at a very high level. So the question is, how do you look at building the aerobic engine for endurance performance by using volume, frequency, intensity? You know, how do you find that that happy blend for your athletes? Uh, and and how have you come upon that the last couple of years in your own uh, training and coaching? Yeah, for me personally, I've just found that uh, consistency over time is by far the most important uh, driver of improvements in endurance performance. And, uh, and and that doesn't mean that you can take an off season where you take two weeks off, but but you want to you want to look at your yearly training volume and not look at well I did ten hours of training per week the six weeks before my race, but I have no idea what entire year. You want to take that big picture view and see how consistent you've been. Have you been training a lot for six months and then been injured for six months? And that's the kind of cycle that I've been in before both in in running but also in triathlon i've I've had my running injuries sort of the same injury actually uh, which ended up being kind of a an interesting one which uh, i still have although i'm not injured but i have still had the same structural flaw in my in my knee that that caused that injury so we'll see if it rears its ugly head at some either way that consistency over time and and trying to when you take time off, make sure that it's planned time off and, uh, and not because you get sick because you have been overtraining or you, uh, you just don't train because you've been overtraining, which I've also been doing, training too much, and then I just lose all the performance that I, that I had in my, in my workouts and, and had to take time off to, just to get out of that. And uh, that's also lost training time that is based on, based on mistakes, training mistakes simply. So, so I guess that the main point there is that you want to have an idea of what your long-term goals are. And, and if you want to reach those goals and you're not currently at that level, then you need to have a certain amount of, of training and apply that training consistently over months and months and years and years. And that's going to make the biggest difference. So, so I think that we all need to be a bit more patient and have a long-term view. So right now, I'm, my main goal this year is the 7.3 Worlds in Nice in September. But I'm actually, when I'm training now, I'm not, not just thinking about that. I'm thinking about how this affects my triathlon in, in three years from now or in five years from now. So trying to always have that long-term view as well. And, and that's also something that helps me make good decisions in, in training and, and not push the boundaries too much, but, but always challenge them a little bit. Now, coach to coach, I think we appreciate how challenging that actually is, uh, especially for beginners, because they, they come and it's almost like it's magic. You know, they, the first three months they see a linear progression is every three weeks they're going to have a new best uh, performance, whether it's based off of pace or, or based off of power. But it's interesting to hear you talking about the long-term goals. How for the listeners out there, how do you break it down? How should one look at their training? If let's say you've done a couple sprints recreationally and you're looking at the Olympic for maybe a local event and you're saying, you know what? I, I need about 10% reduction in my total time. Never had a coach. Um, I have eight hours a week to train. What would be some piece of 
advice that you would give them? Like what are common things that they should be looking at and paying attention to, to help them get to that level? I think for, for triathlon is a difficult sport because we have three disciplines to train for and, uh, and time is at a premium for most. So, so it's difficult to really find, uh, I guess, fit in the work that you would like to do in many cases. I think for, especially for on the more beginner side uh, and beginner to lower intermediate, you want to focus on frequency, perhaps over the total duration of workouts with some exceptions. I think that a long run and a long ride and a long swim in any given week is a key workout and it doesn't have to be a hard workout, but having one long a long workout of each discipline is quite good. But other than that, there isn't anything that is really too short. Like a 20-minute run even off the bike, for example, to save time, that is a great way to get in some extra frequency on the run. So rather than doing two runs per week, you might be doing three runs per week because you're adding in that extra 20-minute run. Or rather than doing three runs per week, you're doing four runs per week because you get that extra 20-minute run. And maybe then you find that actually... I'm getting used to this. I'm getting into the routine. I can push that run to 25 minutes and it doesn't really affect my, my schedule anymore because that's what you'll also find that what felt like a lot to you a year ago might not feel like a lot to you now because you've learned to really appreciate that time but also be effective with that time. But, but to your question, frequency, I would say, is the most important when you're trying to use those eight hours. So... So don't tr try not to do like just two workouts per discipline, but rather try to do at least three workouts per discipline. If you have those eight hours, that's definitely doable. And uh, so free swims, free runs and, and free bike rides. And that means that not all of them are going to be very long. And you might think that 45 minutes on the bike or 30 minutes of running, but that's just a waste of time. But it's, it's not, it's, it's super important to get, get in that frequent, consistent aerobic training. And that's, I, I, in my experience, that's been one of the biggest difficulties and struggles as a coach, getting new, both cyclists and triathletes to understand, you don't need to go out, you know, an hour is a nice block of time. It's why our personal training sessions an hour, why our podcasts an hour, you know, the, the workout's done when it's done, the podcast is done when it, it's done, but so many triathletes come in and say, but I need an hour workout. Well, you don't need an hour workout. If you can barely make it 20 minutes staying in aerobic zone, why don't we make it 15 and build up your technique there? What would be something you'd say to somebody uh, that's really struggling of, oh, all my friends are new triathletes and they're all doing an hour workout, but now, you know, Michael, you're telling me that I should do 20 minutes? How, how can they understand that this is the importance of the frequency? What are you looking for out of these shorter but more frequent workouts as opposed to doing 45 minutes or an hour twice a week? Well, let's take this example. If we have, let's say, three hours of uh, uh, of running that we that we can fit in the the program overall on a weekly basis, then I think that it's much more effective to do one longer run that is an hour and a half, and then you do two forty five minute runs, or even potentially you do one forty five minute run that might be sort of a quality workout. So you do some intervals as part of that run. And then you have 45 minutes left and those can be two brick workouts, easy bricks just to get in that frequency. So it's still easy intensity, 20 and 25 minutes. So you have four runs per week, but the, the durations differ. Uh, another alternative might be to do one hour each time. But then what you don't get, you don't get the, the same frequency because you, you're only running three times per week rather than four times per week. And if you have that better frequency, it, uh, it has uh, definitely an association with improved economy so especially that means that you waste less energy uh, for any given intensity and in running and swimming those are super important so in swimming especially it's easy to think about it that if you swim quite often then it's easier to to improve your technique and and maintain a good technique that you've built up so but this even goes for cycling to, to a slightly lesser extent than, than in running and swimming i would admit but but it goes for cycling as well and, uh, and the, the other thing there is that you do get that longer workout as well, the one and a half hour workout, which uh, probably will stimulate some, some adaptations that you don't get from, from an hour workout. And then at some point you might get really used to the one and a half hour workout and then you might want to try to push it to an hour 45 instead and, and maybe redistribute your time 
So if you still have that three hour time budget, then I would say that, yeah, as you get to a more advanced level and depending on your race goals, like for half Ironman, for example, maybe I would prefer to use an hour 45 minutes for that long run and then remove one of the brick runs uh, so that we can, so we can do that. But, uh, but this really depends. But, but for the beginner, I would, I would definitely try to stay, uh, try to stay on that side of, of frequency. And when you compare, when you compare apples to apples, so you have the three hour time budget for running that, that case that I described with varying durations, but good frequency and, and also a good variety in intensity that is going to be much more valuable than three times one hours, even though you might have three times one hours, there's nothing wrong with that. You might do one intense run and two steady runs, easy runs, aerobic runs, but, but it's still, in my opinion, not quite as valuable as getting that extra bonus of added frequency and that long run as well. So let's break that into a, an easy take home because th- there's a lot there. What would you say, uh, age group triathlete, uh, just getting into uh, Olympic distance, maybe this is their second year and they're looking to be more competitive. They have eight hours a week to train, uh, no history of injury. Um, they're starting to lean out a little bit. What would be your recommendations for building that, that base in April, May? Uh, as far as how to break down those eight hours within that training week. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. So, so I think cycling can usually take up uh, if if you're like sort of uh, a good all not not a good all rounder, but you're you're a well rounded athlete. So you're fairly similar across the disciplines in in terms of your ability level. So then I would say that cycling can usually take up somewhere between forty and fifty percent of the training. Uh, even for an Olympic, if at least if you're looking for performing in that race, if we look at long-term development, perhaps you might work a bit more on swimming or running. But but let's let's put it at fifty percent here because the math is easy that way. So you would be biking for two hours, and then perhaps you'd be running for uh, so so cycling. Sorry, cycling for four hours and and running for two fifty into two thirty, and swimming for. 130 to 145 and i would try if you have eight hours that's sort of like right in the sweet spot where it probably is possible to get to uh, free workouts per discipline per week which in my opinion is uh, is a great number great benchmark to shoot for like if you have six hours per week then maybe you go two 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 because it might not be possible to do much more than that but uh, but with eight hours you can you can do free 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 which is uh, which is a much better, you, you get that increased frequency, which will make a big difference. So, so in terms of the bike, then I would do one, two hour long ride and then two, one hour rides. So, and at least, well, one, one of those would be, uh, would be an intense ride. So it would have some sort of interval work. And then perhaps as you get closer to your race, then you might include some intensity in the other easy ride as well, or some race intensity in that, in part of that long ride. But for most of the year, I think that you can, you, you should, with that time budget, use mostly the two hour ride and one of the one hour rides for just aerobic development. So, so staying at, at a lowish intensity and, and then one of the one hour rides is going to be where you go really hard. On the run, if you have, uh, let's say two, two and a half hours, I would do one run that is an hour 15, probably for an Olympic distance budget and then you could have a second run that is 45 minutes and that could be your quality run with intensity and then you would have a 30 minute run and that uh, could be a standalone run especially earlier in the season it could be just a standalone easy aerobic run and it could also be a brick run and for most of the year that might be just an easy brick run but then again closer to the race it might you might add intensity to that. So add some race intensity after a race intensity bike workout, for example. So, so that would be the run. And then the swim, we had an hour and a half. Uh, so this is where it gets a little bit tricky because that's not too much time really to distribute over free, free workouts. So you could do one forty-five minute swim and then 120 and 125 uh, I, i'm not sure i'm a fan of that i would maybe just simplify it down to one swim that is 50 minutes and one that is 40 or something like that or 55 35 and uh, depending on the level of the athlete i'm if they are 
fairly good technically. I might include intensity in both of those swings. Uh, if not, one of them would be completely focused on technique and the other would be a mix of technique and, uh, and some sort of intervals. And, uh, and that could be, yeah. And the, the other one that's completely focused on technique, I want to rephrase that. So completely focused on technique and aerobic endurance. So very easy swimming and that might be difficult. So if it's difficult to swim easy at all for that athlete, because, because of technical limitations, then it might be just focused on technique. But if the athlete has an easy gear, then, then there, it would be a mix of that technique work plus easy gear work. And the other one would be would include intensity, although not, not all of it would be intense swimming, of course. But that, that's sort of how I would break down that sort of template week on, on that time budget. And we have a, a little bit of a, a different approach as far as uh, the intensity within. So I, I, I agree, you know, with everything you're saying, I think for beginners, it's building that aerobic engine, uh, giving them that focus and technique. I, I think you said technique a dozen times there. And I really want to bring that out for the listeners because we all like to get in the water and swim hard and it feels nice, but putting in the 15 or 20 minutes of technique work consistently uh, really helps immensely. Those times come down, the, the perceived exertion comes down. How do you vary the intensity for where that athlete is based off of life stress or work stress, not sleeping well, you know, how, how do we know that going into that workout, this is the intensity for today? You know, is it, are we sticking with the power meter, uh, the stride power meter or the on bike power meter? You know, how do we, how would you have someone say, this is the intensity for today. And this is how we want to coach that to make sure we're getting the desired effect. I think this depends a lot on the athlete uh, and uh, and this is where the self-coach athlete also needs to do some self-reflection and, and think about what type of athlete am I? Am I somebody who is have, have difficulties pushing myself or am I somebody who is uh, no pain, no gain sort of attitude to, to all that I do in, in training? And uh, the, the approach that I take as a coach if I coach that kind of no pain, no gain athlete, it becomes as much about holding them back and making sure that uh, like, yeah, you are supposed to go hard in those hard workouts, but you don't need to exaggerate it. You're not racing in the workouts because it's not, no single workout is as important as a big block of training. So just do a good solid hard workout and be fine with it. You don't need to puke after that workout. And, uh, and in that case also, what I think quite often correlates is that the no they quite often are also trying to beat their previous paces or powers from last week all the time and, and get can get quite hung up on those numbers. And with those athletes, I, I also want to make them more intuitive and uh, get to know what the feel of a certain intent of the workout is. So if I say to somebody that, that if I give a, a threshold intro workout to somebody I want them to, not from the start, it's not possible if you're just starting out, but but you should learn what it feels like to be riding at your threshold or swimming at your threshold or, or, or running at your threshold. And then you should be able to, if all your devices break down, you should be able to do just as good a workout as that, uh, as what you did with your devices and, uh, and get as much out of it anyway. So, but, but with the other type of athlete that maybe have difficulties pushing themselves themselves they feel a bit more uh, uncomfortable they're not sure if the hurting is from just the exertion or if they're actually injuring themselves with them uh, i do think that it helps to have those paces and powers as a guideline definitely and try to also make them hold themselves accountable to to trying to get through that if it's uh, and in that case for me as a coach the job is to try to give them pace or power guidelines that I know are achievable for them because if it's completely unachievable, then uh, that's going to bring their confidence down even further. And, and that's not a good thing, mm -hmm. but, but uh, what I want to do then is to give them numbers guidelines that are achievable in terms of what powers they can hold. And then even though they doubt, doubt themselves, they try to hold that power and uh, see that they actually did get through that workout and they probably pushed harder than it would have if they were, using like a self-selected uh, exertion level. And, uh, but they learned that that's possible. And that's how you also improve your ability to, to tolerate, which is a crucially important element of being successful at endurance sports. 
So, so that's sort of the, the approach on a, on a high level. And we agree very much on, it sounds like at least uh, from what you're saying that beginners, you know, everybody comes in and two things are prevalent in triathlon. Now, hopefully this is just in the U.S. for the first one, but HTFU, harden the F up, uh, which is, you know, a very football or basketball style mentality. Right. Like you said, every time I have to beat my PR from last time. Um, and the second is building off of perceived exertion. Um, how much do you use that in your training for beginner and intermediate athletes? You know, do you have them go out on the bike and put tape over the power meter and say, right at feel and peak every 15 minutes to see how you're doing? You know, how do you build that in to help them understand, oh, an RPE of four is great for endurance and awful for uh, recovery? You know, how do you build that in and, and help the athlete understand and feel what the body's actually doing? Yeah, the, the thing that we do on a daily basis is that I have all my athletes, we use training peaks and, and I have all my athletes rate the session RPE on a scale of one to 10 after every single session uh, where 10 is really as hard as you can possibly go and, and one is I'm barely moving. And, and then I try to, I see what numbers are coming in and try to, based on that, educate in, in what I want the certain types of workouts to feel like. And usually most high intensity workouts that I give, I want them to feel like an eight or a nine out of 10. And most low intensity workouts would be four or less than four. And it's not at all wrong if they feel like a one. I think that the, the higher the volume that you're training at, the more your low intensity workouts should feel super, super easy. So I give my, when I rate my workouts, there are a lot of ones and twos in there. Uh, I go that slow. And, and then conversely, eights or nines for all around for the, for the hard workouts. But I, I almost never go to a 10, and I don't really want my athletes to, to go to a 10 either. A seven is okay sometimes. Like you just have a really good day, and, and that's, that's totally fine. But, but most hard workouts are either an, an eight or a nine. And the only workouts really that end, end up in that five or six so they are your, your long workouts. So they are at long intensity typically, but, uh, but because of the duration of the workouts, they might be that sort of moderate RPE rating of perceived exertion in, in total. So, so that's typically how it breaks down. That, that's the main uh, tool that we use for, for improving your feel for certain workouts. But then, yes, I do. Actually, I, I don't do that much on the bike, but on the run quite often, and especially brick runs, uh, I have them tape the, the display of their watch and, and go and run at feel uh, because especially it's difficult. It's a race simulation sort of thing as well because then that's where it can be quite difficult to go at the right right pace on running after after getting off the bike. And and on the swim, of course, you, you don't get any immediate feedback for, for how fast you're swimming. So then it's a lot about, it really is about RPE because, yeah, you can check your interval times after each interval and that's great. But uh, you're also having to be able to do that during the interval because if you're going to do a workout that is four times 500 meters, then you've already done a, a quarter of your main set once you get the first piece of feedback after that f first interval. So, so you can't get that first one too wrong either. So, so swimming, I think, is, uh, is good in that way that it, if you, uh, you should take feedback after each interval from... Uh, from the watch on the wall or the watch on your wrist to see how hard you went and, and what it felt like. And that's how you learn pacing with time. Uh, cycling, yeah, I, I think that that's really where the I don't have any particular tool or way that I use. Yes, I, I would be completely for taping the display of or the bike computer in, in some workouts and using that. It's just that that's not something that I've happened to be uh, to, to use very much. So, But that's a, a great way to do things. Uh, what what we do there mostly is, is just having those discussions around how hard a workout should feel. Like when I get comments that this was really all out, I, I could barely uh, I, I could barely stay awake after <laughs> an hour after the work, workout, and and I still had the rest of my day to go through, and and uh, my legs were jittery the rest of the day, etc. Then then I know that, and the session RP was a ten. Then I think that okay, you probably did go a little bit too hard, and and conversely, like if you have comments that indicate that they went too hard on easy ride or too easy on a hard ride then we discuss around uh, more specifically around those sort of perceptions and and what those workouts should feel like and, and that's i guess a conversational tool really that we that we use mostly to dial that in
So it, it sounds like the, the RPE is a, very much a driving force. So uh, I'm sure you're aware Training Peaks introduced the happy to frowny face, and that was revolutionary. Uh, that was something my coach had me do uh, back, you know, back in 1999, 2000, was, you know, put a, a how you felt today, average face, upset face, or a happy face. It, it sounds like you're really relying much more on the perceived exertion of how that rider is feeling rather than chronic training load or training stress score, which I know is, you know, everybody's so focused on that data. You know, how do you explain this to the athlete that it's not about chronic training load? It's not about uh, your training stress score necessarily, but it's how you feel for that workout. Uh, well, to take it a step back, I rely mostly on on actual performance data. So that might be races. It might be uh, time trials like doing your classic 20-minute time trial or an inside performance test or uh, or something else. So, or and just the regular training that you're doing. So if you're doing, and that's why we can't get too hung up on my VO2 max power is 400 watts. So I'm going to go at 400 watts no matter what. No, you should know what your VO2 max efforts efforts feel like. And then if I give you a workout that is 10 times two minutes at VO2 max, maybe I give you a power range. I usually do that for my athletes, but it's a range. And, and then they go and they know as well that if they feel that it's too easy or too hard, they adjust the workout so well if it feels too hard to stay in that range then probably they need to back off and do a completely easy ride but if it feels um, too too easy to stay in that range they are allowed to go above that range they still shouldn't completely kill themselves but but that's just a sign that they have improved fitness wise so so if you manage those 10 by 2 minute intervals at 400 watts uh, a month ago and now you're doing 415 watts for them then, then we know that you and, and the rate of perceived exertion is the same. Then we know that okay, this this is likely your fitness has improved, especially if it happens repeatedly, like at least twice. So, so that's uh, that's I guess the the first sign that performance has improved. We can see it already in the workout performances when we have similar types of workouts that that you repeat, and it's typically in those in those harder workouts. But we can also see it in, for example the heart rate for your long run or your long ride when, when it goes down at, at a similar sort of pace on a similar sort of course and conditions. Uh, but uh, in terms of CTL and, and or well, let's, uh, let's take it to the, the frowning phases first. Yes, those are brilliant. I love them. And, uh, and it's very important to, that the athletes use them as well, just session RPEs from 1 to 10 that, uh, that we just talked about. Uh, so, so those are really good, and I think that on general, it's normal to have bad days. It's uh, a few of them, and it's normal to have very exceptional days. But most of your days really should be neutral days, or are usually neutral days. So, and I think that's when that's especially when you know that you you're striking the right balance of getting the vo volume that is right for you. Because if you, it's easy to have a lot of happy faces if you have. A volume that is not challenging you at all, uh, then then it becomes a lot easier to to always have happy faces. And sure, if you're time limited, that's totally fine. But but if you want to get the most out of yourself, then I think that at that point when you feel that every workout is a new PB and it actually is potentially, then maybe you need to push yourself a bit more, not necessarily by intensity, but by just total uh, total. Uh, chronic load and not in terms of the number that we see in training peaks but actually just what we do out in the field so increasing the the total training volume so in, in terms of that chronic training load yeah i uh, i use it it's a tool in the toolbox but it's not one of the most useful tools it's uh, it has its uses for sure but, but there are many tools that are more useful so i prefer to look at at duration that is the the main thing that i look at because i know that uh, if i give an athlete 10 hours of training per week, I know that I'm going to stick to certain principles regarding their low intensity and, and high intensity and moderate intensity distribution. So, so a 10 hour week is directly comparable to if they did eight hours per week on average the previous year. So I know that, okay, we're improving our chronic training load year on year because now they're doing uh, 10 hours per week. Whereas the chronic training load is, is quite sensitive to thresholds not being correct it, it really relies on that it also relies on uh, on uh, on a lot of other things like like for example uh, normal thieving if you go out and ride like a, 
a very hilly course, for example, or, or a drop ride or something like that, it can be very hard, sure, but you can get an, I guess, artificially inflated normalized power that gives you an artificially high TSS that's not as much as beneficial as the TSS that you get might imply, especially not when compared to just an easy endurance long ride. And I think this is one of the things that leads athletes to underestimate frequency of training because they know that if they do a 45 minute ride at an easy intensity at a zone one recovery intensity or a 30 minute run at an easy intensity it's going to give them almost no tss and uh, well then it's it doesn't matter does it but but that's the, the sort of thinking that we need to get away from because performance doesn't lie in in the pmc in the performance management chart uh, it's uh, it's much more so about frequency how many workouts did you do last year and how many workouts are you doing this year and how many hours did you train last year and how many hours are you training this year so those are much 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 more valuable key performance indicators compared to the ctl and and the pmc although they do have their uses but but they are definitely not something that should be a high priority especially for self-coach athletes because it's too easy to get hung up on them and that reminds me of uh, an episode we did a while ago with uh, Tony Gentlecore when we were talking about strength training. And I had mentioned it also applies to triathlon and uh, cycling training is you should have five, sixes, and sevens, the vast majority of your workouts, and occasionally an eight and nine, maybe a 10, but that should be very rare uh, because of the, the, the toll it takes for the recovery. But it also reminds me, as you're going through this, of something that Bruce Lee said, uh, and I was reminded of by an athlete yesterday during a session. When I was a beginner, a kick was a kick, a punch was a punch. When I had started diving into things, uh, a kick was more than a kick, a punch was more than a punch. And now, as I move towards mastery, a kick is a kick and a punch is a punch. So it sounds very much the same as we can get lost in the TSS and the CTL and, and what was your, you know, it's... The PMC is nice, kind of take a glance at it. Oh, okay, that seems about right. But really it comes down to the frequency, the intensity, and are you doing your workouts properly? And that's really very simple when you look at it from that perspective, is it not? Exactly, yeah. And you touched on that, doing the workouts properly. That's another thing that I think that uh, the TSS obsession leads to. It, it leads to mistakes in, in terms of not executing the workouts properly. Like, for example doing easy workouts too hard because you get more TSS faster that way and, uh, and ignoring to do easy workouts or recovery workouts because of like the ridiculously low TSS that they give. But that low TSS is not reflective of how valuable those workouts are in terms of, again, coming back to building that aerobic engine through frequency and total duration or consistently and over time. So, so yeah, uh, completely agree. Well, let, let's dive down into that. And that's something that um, throughout the time of my working with my athletes, they all notice is that we go from a fairly loose uh, consistency of how the workouts are written uh, to a little bit more rigid. And then during the racing season, especially for the professionals I'm working with, there's really here's the time that you need to hit in total for this specific system. And these are the rest periods you're to have in between, but just get it done. So can you talk a little bit more about the workout execution and, and, you know, how you build this in, you know, how do you make it so it's not too rigid, not too loose, allowing the athlete to get what they need out of that uh, specific workout? Yeah, sure. So if we start on the low intensity end, so your low intensity workouts. So I do use training zones and, and both power pace and heart rate zones. And I think on low intensity, and, and I don't necessarily say to an athlete that you have to use uh, this or that uh, or, or that. I, I think that it's always like you can have everything and, and you can look at everything and, and blend the information because training zones like your zone two heart rate is not going to exactly overlap with your zone two power necessarily. So, so I think that it's quite good for athletes to actually look at, look at everything assimilate that information and make a, a judgment call in the workout with with a variety of, of inputs but i think on the low intensity side is where heart rate is uh, very very valuable and and quite underrated because the world is becoming more and more obsessed with power power is great it, it really is but, but on the low intensity side heart rate can be just as important because you're, you're not 
looking to go at any specific speed or, or power necessarily. You're just looking to get, get the work done, spend time on feet, time in the saddle, time following the black line in the pool, and, and do that at an intensity that is very sustainable, that is not taxing your different metabolic systems at all. You're just building that, uh, that aerobic endurance without, uh, without causing any undue stress that's going to take longer to recover from, even if it doesn't feel that hard to go at that sort of semi-hard gray zone, gray zone intensity. So, so I think to, to sum that up, I, I use heart rate and or power. And typically it depends a bit on what, who the athlete is again. So with that more unconfident beginner athlete that have difficulty pushing themselves, I might feel okay with giving them sort of pace zones. And especially if I know that they go and do their runs on, on flat roads and, and on power, it's of course, yeah, it's regardless of the, of the terrain really. Whereas the the athlete that always want to to push power and pace numbers, I, I so so I think that even if you have a certain heart rate that you're trying to hit or a certain power that you're trying to hit, an easy workout, unless it's a four hour long ride or a, this is all relative, right? A two hour long ride can be a hard workout for a beginner, but but for somebody who's been in the sport for a long time and training for maybe half Ironman, they've done a lot of three hour rides in their days. They've done some four hour rides. So, so a four hour ride, sure, that doesn't feel easy all the way necessarily, but, but those bread and butter one hour, half an hour, an hour and a half, maybe workouts that, that you might be doing on almost a daily, daily basis at a low intensity, even if you are in the right power zone and you are in the right heart rate zone, if you feel that you're working hard, that, uh, your muscles feel a bit like, like jelly or, or that you're, you're feeling like you're swimming through uh, some thick pudding when you're in the pool or something like that, then just go easier because those workouts shouldn't feel hard because that's also going to add in particular mental stress. And it might be a sign that you're already a little bit. So I would still say complete that workout, but then tell your coach what you felt like, give that honest feedback. And that's when the coach needs to, and you need to take that decision together. What, what does that mean? Are you pushing the boundaries a bit too much? Do you need to dial it back? Or was this perhaps more of a one-off, maybe a bad night's sleep, etc. So, so that's why. But the important thing there is to not just blindly follow the power zones, because it's going to be even harder than, and, and you might just get get over that edge in that case, and, and really move into some non-functional uh, overreaching. And this is, has happened to me on several occasions, which is one of the reasons that I've I've learned that the integration of all this information, heart rate, power, pace, and RPE is so important. And, and it's not just about one or the other. And then in terms of the, uh, or sorry, I'll, I'll let you jump in here if there's anything about the low intensity uh, workouts that, that we should dive deeper into or, or clarify. No, I, I think you hit it spot on. And I think that too many athletes are so focused on power um, one, they ride too hard. They're like, Oh, my endurance, my upper end of endurance is X. They, they feel bad being passed by, you know, especially on the recovery days by, you know, her, their grandmother with their Yorkshire terrier in the front basket of their beach cruiser. But that number one, that's, that's really where training adaptations happen is outside of the hard training you're doing, uh, and making sure that you're, you're getting in the right amount of intensity. And I'd like to call them HRV rides or runs where we're going based off of heart rate. So your job out on your ride today or your run is to maintain a heart rate between 120 and 140 beats per minute and to play with it, to make that mind body connection where you're able to say, wow, I'm up at 141. Let's see what I can do with my breathing and relaxing my arm. Oh, I'm down at 137 and I'm maintaining the same pace. So learning how to, to interact deeper, whereas so many people, and, and I see, and I, it sounds like you as well, a lot of coaches, these are your power numbers, just go based off of these. And it's so, uh, it's such a monoculture, if you will, where it's just one thing matters above all else. But as you mentioned, everything matters. You have to look at all of it and kind of find that sweet spot for that athlete. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I really really like that approach of, of trying to see what you can do with, with things like breathing uh, technique in general, like on the run, trying to stay really relaxed, uh, lower your shoulders, loosen your, uh, your cheeks, make sure that you don't have any, any unnecessary tension 
when when you go and do those easy runs it's still you're you're doing really great quality work it's not just quality in the way that it's high intensity but it's still a quality work so you need to on on the bike you can dial in your time trial position uh, or on the bike what i like to do is typically just catch up on some netflix <laughs> or things like that and don't take it too seriously sometimes but but i've done a lot of the uh, i guess the the form work in in the past as well so so I, I sort of have that, that that side of things covered. But to give an example of how easy it can can be, I, I just did a race uh, the other week and, and I finished fifth overall in one of the biggest half-distance races here in Portugal with some seven or 800 participants. And uh, and my bike training, for example, before that race, I, I typically uh, rode my bike five to six times per week. So I'm definitely a high-volume athlete, 20, 20 hours per week or so typically. And uh, two of those rides that i did each week would be just a one hour ride very easy uh, i would go at uh, maybe 150 watts or 140 watts and my my threshold is around 300 watts this is my vanity ftp but my actual threshold uh, at uh, 67 kilograms uh, so but my heart rate was down at 100 and actually the last week or couple of weeks before the race when i got really really fit uh, i had my heart rate down at probably average heart rates in the 97, 98, 99 for a couple of those rides wow. uh, that I did, uh, just indoor on the trainer. So it, that helps with a fan, of course. But but still, and that's to compare to when I do hard intervals, my heart rate is still low. That's just the heart rate profile that I have. But but I'm definitely pushing it into the 150s or 160s, depending on what the, the type of interval it is. So having that large range that you're working with and being okay with it being super easy, well, it still is valuable because for me, that massive volume of bike training that I did, that's what, what helps me be a good cyclist. And, and yeah, that's, uh, uh, that for me is super important. But I don't mind that the power is, looks super low and that somebody's going to look at Strava and see my 140-watt rides or 100 BPM rides on, on Strava at all. Uh, so, so I think that's, that's quite important too. I guess check the ego at the door and and don't yeah leave, leave that out of the training equation because it's on race day that it matters so let, let's get into that a little bit because that's something you know check the ego at the door uh, is the exact phrase one of my coaches says when i said to me when i was 15 and over and over again let's talk a little bit about that and the social pressures that we're now seeing on the coached athletes and especially the self-coached you know how do you how do you wrap your head around uh, at something you mentioned at the beginning, think long term. Don't just think three months, six months, a year from now. Think about the training and how it's building you for three years from now. Do you have specific tools or or suggestions for the listeners as to how they can start to, you know, Strava doesn't really matter because my workout today I was supposed to be slow. You know, what are some things that you tell your athletes or coach your athletes to help wrap their head around and get the right thing done at the right time? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it would be great for an athlete to have to write down their long-term goals. But actually, and this is a practice that just you asking this question triggered uh, me to think about doing this, implementing this with the athletes that I coach, because it's not something that we have done. What we do is a season planning and, and we discuss all the goals for the season. And, and then based on that, we, we establish some season objectives. So, so for example, a season objective might be uh, my season objective this season uh, that will help me achieve my season performance goals is to train on average 18 hours per week because based on what I've done previously that's a bump in volume and uh, and that will definitely be enough of a stimulus that, that I will improve compared to what my performances have been previously but at the same time it's not a jump that is so big that it will uh, that will derail my training by causing me to to overtrain or get injured if I do it right uh, so hopefully uh, so, uh, so that's that's the idea there, and and I think that if you have long term goals, but also season goals, and you can have long term objectives and season objectives, and and an example of objective would be just that: how many hours are you trying to train this year? So don't look at it at a week by week basis necessarily, but at a year by year basis, and and then of, of course then you break it down into smaller parts. So okay, if I need to train five hundred hours this year what does that mean how, how many hours do i need to train per month how many hours per week uh, did i take into account that i'm going to have an off season where i do three weeks without any structured training and uh, and maybe 
maybe lighter recovery weeks after my races and that sort of thing. So, so actually, it's not just 52 divided by 500 that is my weekly number, but I need to train some weeks and less in some weeks. So, so how do you, breaking it down, how you will achieve that essentially? And, and I think, yeah, I mean, it, it is difficult. It, it just takes deliberate thinking about it and goals is perhaps the most the strongest thing that you can do but but then thinking through it if you have a coach and you trust that coach and that coach has a plan laid out for you then it should be easy enough for you to to actually go out and and do that really when when you when you have that end goal in mind if you but if you don't then you need to actually have that discussion with your coach ask the coach to explain to you why it is important that you go at do whatever whatever that training prescription is and, and not go too hard if, if in this example we're discussing easy low intensity rides versus letting them become moderate so so ha- having the clear understanding i actually i i read a, a book or listened to an audio book recently called switch it's called the subtitle is something like how to make change when change is hard yep. and they talk about three concepts of how to change habits whether it's in yourself or in others and uh, or or three pieces of the puzzle that that you all need to you need to have all of them and one is to they talk about an analogy with an elephant rider control this big animal big strong animal and and he can do it in some situations but but if the elephant wants to do something else then he's really powerless in that situation when the when the elephant uh, sees sees a mouse and, and runs away uh, so so the thing that you need to do if you want to make change and change change the habit is to you need to motivate the elephant so the elephant in this case it uh, it is an analogy for our primitive brain and our emotional parts of the brain so so you need to have that motivation and that would be like visualizing yourself qualifying for for the world championships or whatever your big goal is having having a photo of the the world championship finish and uh, perhaps putting your triathlon photo next to it and and looking at that every day and knowing that that's what you're working for and getting that emotional kick out of somehow you you need to figure out how to do that but but having that emotional part of it in place but you also need to of course direct the rider uh, of the elephant because otherwise they're just going to uh, walk around aimlessly and and that's not the idea either so in the, in this case this is an a- analogy for clarity you need to know why you're doing what you're doing like what what is the purpose of this low intensity ride and that's why i think that if you're coached definitely have have a discussion with your coach and make sure that if you don't understand why the coach gives you the kind of workers that they do ask them and and they and they can answer and if you're self-coached well you you just need to be really clear with what you're hoping to achieve with your program but taking the the big picture view because your goal your vision that qualification for the world championships or whatever that's that's a long-term approach but and you also need to take a long-term approach then to that sort of direction that you give yourself and and the final uh, the third piece of the puzzle there is to uh, i forget what they call it in the book but it's something like uh pave the way or or something like that something about the path uh, so that's basically about your environment so setting up your en- environment to be successful that can be things like in Things like alerts on your Garmin, like if you have a certain heart rate that you don't want to get over on your above on your easy workout, set up those alerts to beep uh, once you pass 140 BPM or whatever it is. And then those alerts, that, that's a change in your environment trigger for you to slow down. Uh, so if you just see it on your display, that's a different thing than actually having those alerts. Another environmental change that you can make is to Take off your take take away your Strava account. <laughs> I think I think a lot of athletes would benefit immensely from that. Uh, and I'm I'm not really on Strava. I have Strava and, and all my app workouts sync there, but I I really don't do anything with my Strava. So so for me it doesn't matter at all. So that's why I have it. But uh, but for many athletes, if if you're actually active on Strava, then actually stopping to be active on Strava and and completely deleting your account that might be the way to go there. A thing for me personally that has helped me compared to some problems that I had last year uh, pave the path for me is to stop doing group workouts because on the swim and on track workouts, I consistently killed myself and got 10 out of 10 session RPEs in those hard workouts. 
because I was racing every workout and putting a lot of pressure on myself. So, and, and that wasn't beneficial for how to execute those high intensity workouts. So, so I've, I got away from that and now I do most of my training solo. And, and I find that that works really, really well for me because I don't put that pressure on myself. I don't race myself even when I'm going hard and I'm hitting those eights and nines rather than those tens. So, so that's another example. And uh, it's uh, Chip and Dan Heath are the authors of Switch. I've I've loaned that out. I think I've I have four copies floating somewhere around the world. <laughs> uh, fantastic oh, okay. book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That and uh, the Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. Uh, yeah, fantastic books. But you mentioned you know clearing the path, and and essentially what's great about it, they talk about you know it used to be that clearing the path was you move the large boulders. So that's the first step is you start with the biggest obstacles. And then after a while, we had the horse, uh, horse and wagon. So then we had cobbles. So you're, you're slowly building the habits that are making that path more and more smooth to where eventually you're able to fly down, you know, like the Autobahn and you're going 140 kilometers an hour. Um, but it's interesting that you mentioned setting those alerts, uh, deleting Strava. Oh my God, Mike, what are you talking about? Blaspheme. Why would you say this? Um, but Strava is, is, is the bane of most coaches or triathletes existence because we, we are naturally competitive. We need to know where we stand, right? So if someone doesn't want to delete Strava, what would be one or two tips that you would uh, suggest to them that they try to help keep their workouts on track? Um, yeah, if, if you don't want to delete it, just, just try to ignore it would be my, my second, and my second <laughs> tip. And, uh, letting your your races speak for themselves i i think that's that that's my suggestion there um i mean if if your goal is to to get some strava segments you can train for being get, getting some some koms on strava that, that can be a perfectly fine goal that's the goal but then your training should reflect that goal and you're not going to either way you're not going to try and hit koms randomly in your workout you're going to have a specific date that you're trying to try you're going to try to to peak for that sort of performance it's still going to require a peak performance and in training you still need to be that disciplined i guess a little bit of knowledge of physiology might help because we talked about building that aerobic base if you have a long bike ride let's say you have a, a three-hour bike ride and uh, and you do most of it easy you do most of it in in, in zone two where you should be but, but then you have a couple of Strava segments that you, you like to try to push it on from time to time. So, so you, maybe you do three of them. What happens is that when you really push it hard for a couple of minutes, uh, three times in, as part of that ride, every time you do that, you go very, very hard. You, you use your anaerobic system and as much uh, really all of your aerobic system as well to, to push those, those power numbers if, if they are fairly short segments uh, at least. Lactate. That lactate uh, is used in the in the anaerobic metabolism to, to produce those high power numbers, but it also goes into uh, into the aerobic system then for uh, to be to be used in in the aerobic oxidation of uh, to to produce energy for moving you forward. The thing is though that uh, when that lactate gets into the aerobic system, uh, lactate by the way is a good thing. It's not a bad thing at all. It, it can be used as energy, as uh, as I said, but. Uh, but it's something that we need to be aware of how it works. And, and when that lactate gets into the, the aerobic energy system, which, which it will do when you, when you produce it, because it needs to be, uh, not all of it is, is used in the anaerobic system, but it also needs to be used in the aerobic system. And, uh, and then what happens is that you end up using a lot of carbohydrate uh, to, uh, as, as the metabolite in the aerobic metabolism, uh, rather than fats, which you could be using. And uh, you are going to be using the, the, the goal as an endurance athlete is to be using a lot of carbs and a lot of fats. Like you just need to be able to produce a lot of energy, period. For intensity workouts, you're really trying to uh, work on, uh, on, also on improving your fat metabolism is, is one of the, the main goals there. And, and that's not by going on a crazy diet or something like that. That's just by training at the right intensity, uh, mostly. And, and if you end up doing those trauma segments as part of your long ride, you're going to have lactate in many, many minutes, and this can be up to 10 minutes or, or something, you're going to have a significant amount of lactate in your bloodstream, and that's going to be used preferentially in, in the aerobic metabolism, which means you rely, rely more on carbs than you need to, 
and you don't get the same benefits as if you would have just stuck to your guns and and gone at that 72 intensity that was planned. So so that is an example of again uh, directing the rider in the previous analogy. So having the clarity of why you're doing what you're doing and why it makes no sense to go out and do those Strava KOMs, uh, even though it feels like well it's just two minutes out of a three hour ride. What what difference does it make? But it, it does make a difference. A, a huge one. I mean, it's it's massive. And this is where, uh, in my opinion, a lot of endurance athletes are very confused because we hear, uh, at least I hear, and I, I'm guessing you do as well, when it comes to the strength training, oh, but I need specific adaptations to the imposed demands and I need to do lunges and leg press and, and squats and that's it. I don't have to do anything else. Where they're mixing up the specific adaptations to imposed demand or, or taking it to an extreme in one area Whereas, hey, actually, if you have that zealousness um, in your workouts when it's supposed to be zone two or even zone three and you just stick there instead of trying to uh, blow yourself out because, oh, well, my best speed before was X instead of staying in that specific uh, energy system, the adaptations would be that much better. You know, this is something I think that the endurance world still doesn't quite grasp as far as the average rider and even some of the, the average coaches is that there's a time that you need to be very specific. When a rider is getting up to that second, third year, in my philosophy currently, that's when, hey, you've got a small ring endurance ride today and you're to stay between 130 and 140 beats per minute. And we'll, I've even gone as far as have uh, a semi-professional rider put on a triple chain ring so that we can maintain their heart rate over the Pittsburgh terrain because it's very up and down. And the, the leap that he took from one year to the next when we did that was massive. But the self-awareness uh, and his ability to, as you said before, check the ego at the door, and he got some hard uh, poking from his friends. Oh, look at you. You're, you're using the granny gear. Oh, you're off the back. To, wow, how did you get so fast? Uh, was massive. Uh, do you see that this is a, a big challenge because of the expectations in our sports of triathlon and cycling? Or is it more a misunderstanding of, of when and how to get into the, the minute details? Um, yeah, that, that's a great question. I don't know that I have an answer, but, but I do want to comment that that's another way to really make sure that you, uh, you pave the, uh, pay the path for by, by just prescribing small ring, uh, easy bike rides. So, so that, because then, then you actually have to ex expressively, I guess, uh, go against your coach's orders if, uh, as an athlete, if if you are to go into the big ring so so that's a great way uh, of of making sure that the easy work stays easy uh it, it can of course be difficult in in hilly climates or hilly areas but but yeah i, I really like that that approach uh, in terms of your question i i mean i think that definitely expectations and and again like social media strava etc that plays a huge role and and for athletes that are in a group training environment it, it also yeah, it, it does play a huge role. I, I do see that that's a common place where, it, but it can be difficult as well. I really understand that athletes want to train with their friends and their slightly different abilities. They still want to go at the same pace and they can do it, but it's not optimal for them. So what I try to do in these situations, because I, I see it with my athletes that train with their friends, not so much even an ego thing for them. It's just that this is the time for them to be with some friends and they might not have that time uh, that much otherwise so so it's a compromise and uh, and what 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 we then just tend to discuss is that okay i mean we that's perfectly fine that you maybe go a bit harder in in this uh, on this sunday sunday ride if you if you need to do that to keep up with your friend and the friend really don't want to or cannot slow down for you but we just this is potentially going to compromise or slow down your improvement as, as an endurance athlete and, and are you okay with that uh, having you, you can make that choice the choice is up to you but, but you need to be aware of what the potential consequences might be so so that's uh, that's definitely it and, and what was the the other option again that you that you mentioned i already lost myself in in the question where we, we've kind of uh it's a misunderstanding we we don't fully understand when to apply specific adaptation to impose demands to, to a stricter T. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I think that that's definitely an issue. I, I kind of, the way that I look at that is uh, it's, 
in in many for many self coach athletes in particular it, the the training becomes a bit like a like a frankenstein's monster because it consists it's it's the the result of 13 articles on training peaks uh, two free training plans from a google search and uh, the i guess the the workouts that they got from two previous coaches and then what their best friend is doing and what chris Froome is doing and uh, and what everybody else says that they should be doing and so so that's not not ideal there's just so much information out there which is great and uh, we're both contributing to this by by having our podcast Uh, but but uh, i think that the the athlete needs to take responsibility for being critical of information that they consume and and also understanding how to integrate information and that you cannot use everything and when in doubt uh, simplicity is usually the better answer than complexity so uh, I make, make things as as simple as they need to be, uh, not simpler than that, but as uh, well as as simple as they can be, uh, not not any simpler than that. I think that I'm paraphrasing a bit, but I think somebody like Albert Einstein said uh, said that. So so I think that's that's a common problem that that the complexity and all the fancy workouts that you can read about in in articles online mostly these days and and hear people talk about that's sort of confuses and and muddies the waters uh, quite a lot and and that's that's another issue yeah and it's interesting that you mentioned uh the two free training plans from google and then the one from my other coach before and then what chris Froome is doing we have so many influences as triathletes and cyclists um have you noticed specific common themes in the athletes that you coach and and two or three common behaviors or thought processes that they have and that always show up or consistently show up in their ability to climb and progress quickly? Great question. I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think since, since the, I don't want to say obsession necessarily, but over-reliance on things like the PMC, the performance management chart and CTL, that's definitely a trend that I see. And, and also, um, I guess a rigid approach to to metrics to power numbers, for example. I mean, I think power is fantastic, and we would be nowhere near our ability to train as effectively as we train without power meters. Don't get me wrong, but but also uh, when you get guidelines, you need to accept that they are guidelines and and they're not the be all end all answer. Like a perfect example is race pacing. Not everybody should be between 80 to 85 percent FTP uh, for their half Ironman race power, you, but but that's what everybody thinks because they there are some articles that rank high on Google that say that that's that's the race pace for for half Ironman, and uh, so so I guess there is a pro- proliferation of of those sorts of guidelines that become rules that are set in stone, and yeah, I, I think that that's uh, that's a common trend, uh, I guess a negative trend because we we need to not be quite as rigid in in our approaches uh and but as for as for the i think the on to turning that question to to what the common themes in terms of improving i think long term goals that's something that i see that the athletes that have long term goals they they really seem to do better and uh, but but they manage to stay consistent much much better uh, and the third thing that I want to mention, and, and this again is, is another like positive trait that that I think that improving athletes athletes seem to have. Uh, they have a great, actually, I want to ma- mention two things: great enjoyment for the sport and for the process. So going through the process of training and not putting too much pressure on themselves to beat themselves or beat their previous perf- performance records from from the last week or last year every single time. Just going out and, and enjoying the training. And the final thing is definitely time management and really like you, you can get really good at time management and creative use of use of time. Like for example, uh, I think a lot of athletes spend a lot more money on gear that could be spent, for example, on getting a cleaning lady or getting a babysitter every now and then. So you could have a little bit more time to, to train when needed. Uh, so, so making the right sort of decisions there in that area, so prioritizing becomes becomes important. Yeah, that, so the cleaning lady would would be an example of how you can buy yourself a bit more time, but of course you can also make yourself more time for free 
uh, in various different ways by, by just effectively planning planning what you're doing. So sitting down on Sunday night and looking at the week ahead, but also doing it way more in advance, letting your coach know when you will be traveling for work and so that we can plan a, an easy week for that week. And and then the previous week can potentially be a lot a bigger week that, that you can train a lot more and then you'll recover when you're when you're traveling. So so yeah, I mean time time management and uh, enjoyment for the sport and and having those long term goals those would be three important attributes that I see in in athletes that are uh, that are improving and also being being coachable. But that doesn't mean that they rigidly follow every word that their coach says. Says they can question it and we can have a discussion around it. And uh, and sometimes uh, we think it's best. Uh, that quite often happens actually. But uh, but th- those are, are some of the most important qualities, I think. That is one of the best answers uh, I've heard in a long time, to be honest. Uh, I've been around the block a couple of times, but the mention of enjoyment of sport, I mean, that's one of the two rules that I have for working with me. Rule number one is this should be fun. It doesn't mean you're going to have a smile on your face and you're laughing and giggling, but it's going to be hard work, but you're going to enjoy the process. Uh, and two is communication. I love the fact that you mentioned that you should not blindly follow what your coach is telling you that there are times and I'm guessing with you as well there are times that you'll explain to the athlete and the athlete still doesn't comprehend and say just trust me on this this is the workout that's right for today but here's the two adaptations that you can make if you feel uh x or y is is that something that you do as well Uh, I I lost I lost the middle part there of that last question with uh, about the communication. So can you repeat that? Mm -hmm. Uh, When you communicate that the athlete should not blindly follow. So I'm I'm guessing that in your practice as well, uh, there come workouts where you say to the athlete, "Trust me, this is the right workout for right now." However, if you feel X, this is the adaptation. If you feel why, this is the adaptation to make this a, a good workout for you. Is is that a true statement for you? Y- yeah, ab- absolutely. Yeah, you put if else, uh, if else solutions and uh, and that sort of thing in in workouts and and learning t- teaching uh, the athlete how to adjust to certain uh, certain situations and and then uh, and and then perhaps if you one 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 example that I think of is that. Uh, with one of my athletes, I, I really wanted to work on his VO2 max. And, and we did that for a while. He did that. And, and this is an athlete that has typically done a lot of sweet spot and tempo training on the bike, especially. And, uh, and we agreed to do VO2 max because I thought that would be best for his development. Uh, so we did uh, a weekly, sometimes two weekly VO2 max sessions on the bike and a lot of uh, high volume, one weekly long ride that was four to five hours. Uh, but then after a few weeks, the athlete came to me and said, look, uh, I don't feel, I'm, I'm not enjoying these VO2 max workouts very much. And I don't feel that I'm adapting to them quite as much as I used to adapt to the sweet spot work. Can we try the sweet spot work again? And uh, then in that situation, I also know that he's an experienced and knowledgeable athlete. So it wasn't a difficult decision for me to uh, just say just, yes, we, we do, as you suggest, we do the sweet spot workouts and take away the VO2 max sessions. So if, if you feel that you're not adapting to them as, as well as you should, then, then that's the, the logical consequence. And, and this athlete has a history of knowing what, what has worked in the past. So, so let's, let's revert back to that. So, so yeah, it's, it definitely is uh, about being flexible, both as, a, as an athlete and a coach and, and having good communication and, and being open, open-minded to, uh, to suggestions from the, from the other party. And it sounds like that's also a point where you might look at HRV training or uh, using inside to help get a better understanding of, of what the athlete's strengths and weaknesses are, or, or is that already built into the program before you get to this point? Yeah, inside training was the basis for doing the VO2 max training. So, so physiologically, it made sense to, to do the type of training that I wanted to prescribe. But then what happened is that in the real world, the athlete just didn't feel the adaptations. We didn't retest it at that point, but, uh, but, but I think that this athlete, I, I knew the, know, know that that athlete is, is a very experienced athlete, very good athlete. And uh, so I trusted him and his judgment. So, so that's why we made a call to, to go against what the, uh, the physiological uh, reports that we got from the testing would uh, would propose that we that would be the best solution and uh, go, go completely against that and just go on on the athlete's intuition and experience 
And that's the the art part of coaching, which I think is being lost, in, in my opinion, is being lost today, where so many people were like I was the first half decade that I was coaching. Show me the research and then I'll do it. Well, it depends. Each athlete is a study of one and you have to really uh, you know, understand that athlete. Some beginner athletes may say they, they know what their body needs and, and we all kind of have a feel. And that's where that, that art comes in as a coach where, okay, well, let's talk about this and, and looking for those markers. Is there anything in, in your um, metamorphosis, we'll say, as a coach that's really um, found you or brought you to, to finding that blend of art and science is much more gray uh, as opposed to black and white? I mean, I would say that the the biggest influence on that is all these uh, conversations that I have with people like you uh, on podcast interviews, uh, all the interviews that I, I do for my podcast especially has given me access to so many of the greatest coaches in the world and seeing how they all do things slightly differently. Uh, also, some of them specifically talk about that, those different approaches that they take with different athletes. So just seeing that in the real world, there, there is no single formula that works for everybody. And there are great, great, great coaches, the most successful in the world that do things completely differently from one another if they have their like favorite approach. So, so that just shows that there are different approaches. Uh, but, uh, and, and that's, that's one thing, I guess, that I've taken as influence. That's okay, okay, we need to realize that even though there might be stronger evidence for, for one thing versus another, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily the, the better thing to do for, for the athlete. I, I would say uh, for sure that that is the, the biggest lesson or, or the, the, the biggest driver for me learning that it's, it's not black and white and, and there are many, many shades of gray here in this area. Uh, Michael, we've, we've covered a lot today, <laughs> quite a bit. And uh, you have so much more. I, I really wish that, uh, you know what? We're going to have to have you back at least uh, two or four or 14 times here. Because uh, <laughs> there's a lot of questions. I have about three pages here of other stuff. I, I, we wanted to kind of stick with uh, building of the aerobic engine and the workout execution and how it's the simplicity of things. You know, what would you say uh, for today uh, is the big one or two I guess the word would be uh, messages that you'd like the listeners to remember. What are those one or two chords that you'd like to hit one last time as we wrap up here? Okay. So the big, uh, the big message would be uh, focus on the long term. If, if you're planning to be an endurance athlete for a long time, then, then focus on that, have, have your vision and realize that nothing is as important as uh, consistency, fre frequent training over time with great, great, great consistency. And, uh, and in terms of improving as an endurance athlete, uh, one, one of the best things that you, you can do is to have the right amount of, of training. And quite often, if you want to improve, you would be increasing your amount of aerobic training. So endurance training, but most of that training should be at a low intensity. And then you would have some high intensity as well. But with the high intensity, you don't need to beat your PRs every single week. You shouldn't raise yourself to put pressure. You should not put pressure on yourself because that's a, a recipe for not performing in those workouts. So, so execute your workouts correctly. Know what the purpose of the workout is and, and go in with that knowledge and then execute on, on that. And, uh, but yeah, just to hammer home, home that message, consistency, uh, frequency, and the biggest aerobic adaptations over time, really, they, or endurance sports adaptations over time, they come with the total amount of aerobic training that, that you're going to be doing. So think in terms of hours per year of training. That is the most, most important training objective when it comes to reaching any performance objective, in my opinion. And Michael, you have a ton of resources on scientifictriathlon.com. Are there any in particular that, that uh, you're, you're promoting right now or you'd like for the audience to, uh, to look for? Because you've, you've got some awesome offerings there, pre-made training plans. Uh, you also do the inside training as well. What types of, of things uh, do you offer for the listeners who are interested in working with you? Yeah, so I, I have uh, pre-made training plans uh, either on Training Peaks or as PDFs. And, uh, and then I have uh, the inside testing, so uh, the critical power testing on the bike. So that can be done at home with, with a power meter or on the road, but remotely. So you don't need to go to a lab and uh, get that metabolic testing. And that can be great if you want to learn specifically about the, uh, the right 
uh, right intensity to do to do your training although that still only integrates power it should be said so so it doesn't give you license to uh, forget heart rate and rpe as we as we discussed already and and then finally i do coaching i'm, I'm currently uh, not coaching at the moment uh, unless you are a professional athlete or or a budding professional athlete then uh, we can have a talk because then I, i'm interested uh, but but we also have uh, uh, james teagle is a great coach who also on, on the coaching side so so you can check out coaching and he james might have some available slots and either way if you're interested in, in coaching then just drop an email and and there is a waiting list so so you can get a get a place on that so so we have the coaching and the training plans and the inside testing mainly but but the real the, the biggest thing the most important thing because that's the one that has the biggest reach and the most impact is the podcast so that triathlon show and uh, that comes out every monday and thursday and uh, has done so for for a long time now for for two years so there's a ton of episodes there really from from the very start there are some real real goodies in, back in the archives to to check out that and uh, our evergreen content that that you can learn from even though it's not uh, still relevant and i strongly recommend to the listeners out there uh don't just listen to one episode of that triathlon show go over to their page like and subscribe give them a review after you listen to your first one because uh, Michael is one hell of an interviewer. Uh, lots of great information there. And also today, uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we definitely have to have you back. And uh, there's so much here. So I hope you guys have a pen and paper and, and are going back through and listening. Uh, Michael, thank you so much. Thank you, Menachem. And uh, also one, one more thing to mention is that the listeners should go and listen to your interview on on that triathlon show when when it comes out or if it is out already. It will be out in... Uh, mid-May 2019, I think, because you recently did a great episode on on the podcast, a two-part interview where we uh, dove deep into strength training for triathletes and endurance athletes. So, so check that out. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm the worst promoter. <laughs> 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 I just like talking shop, man. This is, this is awesome. <laughs> Thanks, thank you. So make sure you listen to that one, but uh, don't wait for that one. Uh, there's so many other ones out there. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Manash. Hope that you enjoyed this interview. I think it shows that we really enjoyed having this conversation, just like uh, it showed when I interviewed Brody for my podcast. And uh, in actual fact, we have started having regular calls to just discuss coaching and everything that goes with it to learn more from each other off air. So I can honestly say that it has been really amazing getting to know Brody and uh, I've already learned so much from him. So I hope that we can keep that up and that I can also contribute a little bit uh, myself to that relationship. I encourage all listeners to check out uh, the Strong Savvy Cyclist and Triathlete podcast, as well as the Human Vortex YouTube and Instagram channels. It's uh, HV Training on, uh, on YouTube and Instagram, I believe. Uh, because uh, Brody produces great content around strength training for endurance athletes on those different channels. So check them out. As usual, you can find the show notes for this episode on that triathlonshow.com and we'll link to uh, the episodes I did with, uh, with Brody as well, episodes 182 and 183, so you can listen to them if you haven't already. Please subscribe to the podcast so that you don't miss anything Remember, we have Q&As every Thursday and uh, longer feature episodes every Monday. And uh, next Monday, I believe, although we haven't recorded it yet, but I believe that we will have a scientific triathlon coaches get together where James, Lockie and myself uh, get together to discuss base training, which is one of the most asked questions I get from listeners. What to do when you've finished your A race and uh, you have, uh, let's say, six months until you really are going to start your race specific training for next year's races and uh, it's also a question that i get a lot from customers of our training plans who have completed their season goal and and now think now what so uh, so this uh, episode is going to focus on that what are you going to do when your race is over and you have uh, many many months before you can start any race specific training so that will be an exciting one to do i'm looking forward to talking with james and Lucky and hearing their opinions on the topic Big thanks to our sponsor, sponsors, Roka, that you can find on roka.com. Get 20% off your entire order of wetsuits, trisuits, swimskins, and high-performance eyewear with the promo code TTS, all caps. 
And thank you to Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Take your free online sweat test to get a personalized hydration strategy for your next race. And try your first box or tube of Precision Hydration electrolytes for free with the promo code that Triathlon Show, all one word, all caps. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart. Keep loving triathlon. <laughs>